Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. We don't need no badges. I don't have to show you any stinking badges. I tell you right out, I'm a man who likes talking to a man who likes to talk. You're gonna have to answer to the Coca-Cola company. Hey, Lou. May the force be with you. You are a toy! Hello and welcome to the stuff that screams are made of. I'm Stephen Spooky Parker, and I'm Jessica Parker. And this isn't really going to be that much of a Halloweeny show. Um, we've got some movies to talk about, and um, we've got a marathon on uh, Greta Gerwig, and she's not that spooky of a person. I think there were a couple horror movies that she, like, had been in, but we didn't get into those because we didn't plan this out very well. But we are tackling, um, Alfred Hitchcock, the master of suspense, his, uh, classic film Rear Window, so that's kind of spooky, right? Right. We're on theme. <laughs> Anyways, so, how are you doing, Jessica? Hmm. <laughs> That's yes. about the same as me. Um, I hope we're all hanging in there, everybody. I, I hope you guys are hanging in there, too. Speaking of hanging in, um, Jessica and I are married, if you didn't pick up on that. And we just celebrated <laughs> our fourth wedding anniversary. Um, and as one of the things we, we splurged on for that is we did one of those uh, things at Cinemark where you rent out an entire theater and it was just us. And we also invited your mom. Because, because she's in our quarantine pod. She's in our quarantine pod. And we figured it would be more cost efficient to spend $150 for three people to see the new mutants than just two people. <laughs> so anyways, we saw the new mutants. We spent $50 a person uh, to see it. Um, how did you like the new mutants? It was, I thought it was a good popcorn flake. Yes, it was good. It was so, nice to have popcorn. It was nice to be in a theater, you know. <laughs> and it's a little spooky, so that's also on theme. It's a, it's a little spooky. I, I think that's one of the problems. Is that, it was selling itself as a horror film, that's right. And it's not, well, it doesn't really know what kind of movie it is. It kind of is a little bit all over the place. There's a lot of good stuff in it. You know, I think all the performers are good you know this is uh, supposed to be an x-men spinoff and it is very x-men like they definitely give you these characters that they work really hard to feel like they come from different backgrounds like mm -hmm. i feel like that's definitely an x-men thing is for somebody who's from the south to have that heavy of an accent as the coal mining kid you know? I'm, the, I'm the coal mining kid not do coal mining yeah <laughs> <laughs> Basically, and then you got a uh, little um, Maisie Williams is uh, the the wolf's bane, I guess, and she was she was really good in it. And yeah, then you know all the young people were good. We got Anya Taylor Joy as the psycho Russian chick, and Danny, the girl who played Danny, did a really great job. Yes, it it I can see why it hasn't been released until now. It's not something they really know what to do with, and also it's very. Um, pre-MCU buyout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of an orphaned film. It's an orphaned film. <clears throat> it would have been interesting to see where it goes, um, but it was it was fine. It was it was a it was a continuation of the some of the things that were going on in Logan. And honestly, this may have been filmed oh. before Logan, so <laughs> maybe it was supposed to tie into that. Who knows? 
Um, and yeah, um, one thing I really appreciated it had a, a you know a solid um, representation for an LGBTQ romance. It wasn't like something that they flashed in the in a corner for half a second and say, "Oh, look at us, we're progressive." You know, it was a, a main driving force, and it I, I you know kudos to this movie for that. Yeah, no, it was really refreshing. Yeah. I mean, that's something you can give the X-Men. It's always sexy. <laughs> uh, oh, don't laugh at me too hard. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking of Brian Singer now. Oh, so. <laughs> no! Oh, no! I'm even talking about the comic books, okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sorry Brian Singer has tainted the X-Men franchise. <laughs> it was never that great. They didn't ever really live up to what it could have been, let's be honest. So, poo-poo well, to you, Brian Singer. Well, let, let's see what Disney does with it. So, um, one other, um, we, a documentary that we streamed on Netflix was, was my... was my octopus teacher. Yes. Which is about another X-Men class where they have an octopus professor. <laughs> that would also be excellent. That would be excellent. No, it's this is a completely opposite of what this movie is. Yeah. Do you want to explain what this movie is? Oh, this movie is just the most soothing film we've watched probably in six months, even though we have definitely kept an eye towards um, <clears throat> gentle viewing in some ways. Um, no, it's like, so this movie is about um, a documentarian who gets burnout, and so he returns home to where he grew up um, in South Africa uh, on this cape where it's fairly rough going but he returns to like a childhood um exploit of his which is scuba diving and he encounters an octopus and becomes uh <clears throat> enamored with this and kind of the idea of, of filming this every day yeah it's him finding this octopus and and you know analyzing with nature and yeah. his humanity and yeah and it is interesting um the the ease and stuff that nature brings us because you know nature isn't necessarily peaceful and this movie or gentle no. or gentle this <laughs> this movie captured capitalizes on it you know the the octopus is both the hunter and the prey in some instances and sometimes you feel bad for the octopus being hunted and then you're just like oh that poor crab <laughs> that it, <laughs> it's trying to eat you know it's the world of nature is interesting because no one is you know quote-unquote evil but they're hungry you know, everything mm -hmm. is just moving at its at its point and but there's something nice about that. You know, it's a it's a world uncluttered by the types of problems that he was probably having off screen. <laughs> yes. So yeah, this it's a soothing, charming documentary and it is on Netflix. My Octopus Teacher. Highly recommend it. Um and then we went to the drive in. And we saw a horror movie. We saw Possessor, uncut as it's being um, bandied about. Um, I mean, the movie is just called Possessor, but I guess there was some hype about it being excessively bloody and explicit coming out of Sundance. And it is. It is. It is. I don't know that it's, like, unmatched mm -hmm. in its gore. Yeah. But it was that, for sure. Uh, I'm just getting a couple of, uh, you know, uh, twitch twitch uh, moments from recalling <laughs> some of the scenes. Recall, yeah. it's um, It's got Andrea Riseborough, um, and as basically, it's hard to describe what her job is. I guess she's a possessor. She works with this technology where they basically take over people's bodies and assassinate people. <laughs> to to cover their tracks. And you might remember her from Mandy, another ultra-violent film, actually. Mandy or Death of Stalin, which not as violent, but it has it had its moments. Oh, that's such a know. great film. She's she's good. But yeah, and um this is directed by Brandon Cronenberg, who's the son of David Cronenberg. And, and he goes, you know, body horror, that's my dad's thing. Uh how about some existential dread? With a smattering of body horror on this side. <laughs> For good measure. <laughs> so yeah, it's 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 a good movie. You know, it's it's interesting. It provokes thought. Um, 
wasn't too outlandish for me, though. It doesn't make much of an impact. How about you? Yeah, it's ultimately somewhat forgettable. Probably mostly because it's just not my genre. Yeah. It's not your genre. But it it is nice to, to catch a, a scary-ish movie around Halloween and to catch it in a drive-in. Uh, we almost went and saw it at a movie theater. It was like the middle of the day. Um, Jessica's system wasn't working. I had the day off. We're like, maybe we can get away with going to the movie theater like we did for our anniversary. It was so... Um, uh... We, it was it was just there was not a lot of uh, not a lot of hubbub and you know we we had free movie passes for this theater so I was like let's let's give it a shot and we gave it a shot and just as it was starting some folks came in and we just didn't feel comfortable uh, sitting in an enclosed area with folks so we took off and we started the drive-in that weekend so but hey we bought some concessions so that was good yeah we we a concessions. we a concession supported our movie theaters but the re the real thing to support our movie theaters would be to talk to your leaders in washington and have some sort of bailout because even if they are open people aren't going to go to the movies while there's a dangerous virus so they could definitely use some assistance mm -hmm. follow me <laughs> well jessica um, we're gonna, before we get into our Greta Gerwig marathon, I have a game for you. So this is the IMDB game, if you're a fan of Doug Loves Movies like we are. So I've got 11 actors here. Um. Jeez, I'm really sad. I just was like, we haven't watched Doug Loves Movies in a while. Or listened <laughs> to it because, well, he's not doing Doug Loves Movies. He is. Oh, he's not? Oh, he is. He's just not in the same way. It's not like in a crowded club. Yeah, he, he's, he's, yeah he's still doing it he's, sometimes. He's carrying so. on. I, I got it. And you. it's changed. But anyways, I've got 11 actors here. I'm, I've written down their top four movies on IMDb, which is based on some metric. You know, either popularity or sometimes the actors pick them themselves. Some of some of them seem straightforward. Some of them are weird. So mysterious, unknowable metrics. And there may be a theme to emerge. So um, I'll let you pick up on that theme as it comes along. So all right. First off. Oh, and then, so I'm going to read you the first one, and you can ask for the next one, or you can hazard a guess um, as to which um, actor you think it is. Mm -hmm. And you don't get any points if uh, you guess wrong. But if you do guess right, you can earn additional points by guessing the other movies in their top four. Okay. So, do you think you can do this? I will give it my level best. Okay. Uh, first thing. What actor is best known for Hairspray? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, might need another one. Uh, ha Hairspray and X-Men. Hmm. This one should probably be more obvious at this point. Uh, okay. But hold on, hold on. Just think about it. I'm trying to think, Do you want is Michelle one? Pfeiffer in both of these? The look you're giving me says no. Is that your guess? That is my first guess. Then you're wrong. Sorry. <laughs> I can't even think of... You could have You could have asked for another one, so... Oh, is it, is it over? No, I'll, I'll, let you ask, I'll let you okay. ask for one more. I, the I first do round, want to but ask yeah. for one more. Okay. All right, the last next one is Enchanted. Oh, hairspray, this is X -Men. hairspray, James Marsden. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry, Corny Collins. How yeah. did I forget? Yep. All right. Can you? Do you know what the fourth one of his would be? Um, I would go with mm, twenty-seven dresses. You got it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> However, since you guessed wrong, that one was a practice round. So. All right. All right. The rest of these are deadly serious. Okay. Deadly serious. All right. Who is best known for Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring? I'm going to need another one. Who is but also known for Lord of the Rings, Return of the King? <laughs> I'm going to need another one. 
<laughs> who is be also best known for Gods and Monsters. Oh. Uh, is this one Ian McKellen? It is Ian McKellen. <laughs> His last one will be... Um, I'm going to hazard a guess at X-Men. Sorry, it is Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just going to spice it up, you know? <laughs> All right, but you got one point for Ian McKellen. So. <laughs> All right, next up, Logan. Logan. Um, is this one Patrick Stewart? It is Patrick Stewart. Excellent guess. It's risky <laughs> to do the first one. I had a good feeling about it. All right. What's your... Uh, there you got three hazard. more. What What are you going to hazard? Ooh. Uh, wow. Yeah, now I have to fill three spots, don't I? Three spots. Yep. Patrick Stewart. Let's say Star Trek Nemesis. Nemesis. Um, let's also say um, X-Men. Another X-Men movie. I'm going to guess the first one. Okay. Which, it's, it's Sir Patrick Stewart. It is Sir Patrick Stewart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there's got to be like a Shakespeare on there, but just like, which one would it be? Uh, do I know if he's in a filmed version of a Shakespeare movie? Mm. Uh, 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 <laughs> Patrick Stewart. Patrick Stewart. You can always hazard another one of those bigger movies, you know. I could. Let's just say X3. All right. You got one, X-Men. The other ones were Star Trek First Contact oh. and Star Trek Insurrection. <laughs> <laughs> so you got two points for Patrick Stewart. All right. All right. Who is best known for Catwoman? Catwoman. Um... Holly Berry. It is Halle Berry. <laughs> I did it again! Oh no! <laughs> well, I mean, um, that one is fairly obvious unless I pulled out a Sharon Stone on you. But yeah, you got three other movies. I should have just asked for another one, though, so I can have one of the titles out of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, Catwoman, I'm going to say X-Men. X-Men. I'm going to say X3. X3. And I'm going to say... Um, I know there's one with like some crazy sci-fi stuff. Uh, do I know its name? Like Cloud Atlas? No, I do not. Let's just say Cloud Atlas. Okay, you didn't get any of them. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, number two, they have Gothica. Ah. Uh -huh. Number three, Die Another Day, James Bond. Oh, she was a Bond girl. She I was a Bond that. girl. And number four, the movie she got her Oscar for, Monsters Ball. So, you got one point for Halle Berry. All right, uh, Les Miserables. Who's best known for Les Miserables? Maybe we'll have to do a Halle Berry marathon, Stephen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Blind spot, for sure. Les Miserables. This one's going to be Hugh Jackman, then. Uh, it is Hugh Jackman. Um, you got three more guesses. So, for Hugh Jackman, I am going to guess... Um, well, there. We have Les Miserables. I'm going to guess... Um, It's like the name has escaped me all of a sudden. You know, the Freaks one. The uh, Freaks one? Circus. Uh, oh, uh, Greatest Bay. Showman? Greatest Showman, mm, okay. yes. Okay. <laughs> greatest Showman. Um, I'll say, yes, Greatest Showman. I'll say X-Men. I'll say X3. It's got to be on somebody's. Okay, so you got one. <laughs> you got X-Men. That's number four. Number two is Logan. And number three is X-Men Origins Wolverine. Oh. <laughs> so that's two points. Should have guessed Logan. For Hugh Jackman. All right. <clears throat> um, who is best known for The Hunger Games? So this is going to be Jennifer Lawrence. It is Jennifer Lawrence. So I'm going to guess Hunger Games. I'm going to guess Mother. Mother. Uh, I'm going to guess um, X-Men First Class. Okay. And is there just one more? Just one more, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's do Silver Linings Playbook. Silver Linings Playbook. You got two. Uh -huh. You got Silver Linings Playbook. That's number two. X-Men First Class, number four. You missed American Hustle. Uh -huh. So that's three points for Jennifer Lawrence. <clears throat> All right. Who 
is best known for X-Men The Last Stand. I'm going to need another one. X-Men The Last Stand and Goldeneye. Mm. Another Bond girl. Mm. Is this one going to be... I'm a bad feminist and I don't know the actress's name mm. off the top of my head. Do you know who she plays in X-Men The Last Stand? I'm thinking it's got to be Jean Grey. I will give you half a point. It is <laughs> Fomke Jansen. <laughs> I'm going to give you, and I'll give you that full point because I don't know if I said her name right, but. <clears throat> <laughs> there we go. All right. So you got two more guesses. What do you got? So the first one you said was. X-Men, The Last Stand, and Goldeneye. And Goldeneye. Um, I will guess, um, is it X2 and X-Men The Last Stand? I've been saying it wrong the whole time, huh? And there's X2 and then there's X-Men 3 The Last Stand, so. <laughs> um, I'll guess X2. X2. And, jeez. I can, like, see her and I can, I just don't know if I can place any other, like, film roles. So I got X Men three, Golden Eye. You guessed X two. I'll guess X Men. Um, right. Just X Men. Just X Men. Okay, you got one X Men. <laughs> uh, the last one, number four, is the House on Haunted Hill. So okay. the remake from the nineties. All right, who is best known for Shame? Gonna need one more. Uh, who is also known for Prometheus? Is this uh, Michael Fassbender? Yes, it is Michael F. Fassbender. <laughs> All right. You got two more movies for Michael F. Fassbender. Uh, what do you guess? I'll guess Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre. And what was the X-Men movie that you named? Which one? You name I said first Shame class? and Prometheus. Oh, so let's say X-Men First Class. Okay. X-Men First Class is number three. Number four is Steve Jobs. So. Oh, I should have been able to guess that one, huh? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I wouldn't have thought of Steve Jobs. <laughs> All right. Who is best known for Mad Max Fury Road? Uh... Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, this one will be uh, Nicholas Holt. What a day. What a <laughs> lovely day. You got it. All right. You got three more guesses. What okay. do you think uh, else Nicholas Holt is in? I'm going to say Warm Bodies. Okay. X-Men First Class. Okay. And isn't he the boy from About a Boy? And About a Boy? You got two out of three. Number two, About a Boy. Number three, Warm Bodies. Number four, X-Men Days of Future Past. So, Random. <laughs> that's three points on that. All right. <clears throat> Who is best known for filth? Filth. Filth. That's the name of a movie. <laughs> filth. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to need another one. Filth and Atonement. Oh, this one will be James McAvoy. Yes. Um, I thought it was interesting <laughs> that filth was his number one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. oh, All right, two more. Hilarious. What do you got? Well, let's also say X Men First Class. X Men First Class. And okay, Atonement. You said in Filth, and mm -hmm. that would be another one for him. Uh, I'll say I'll be on theme and say Frankenstein. <laughs> oh no no. Victor Frankenstein. Victor Frankenstein. Okay. Yes. <laughs> now both of those are wrong. Number three, they went with Split. Split. Oh. And number four, they went with The Last King of Scotland. So, oh. one point for McAvoy. All right, last one. Who is best known for Juno? Oh, well, that is easy to see her face. It is easy to see her face. <sighs> what bad person. Or their, his face. It could be either one. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I need to ask. I'm a bad feminist again. And I need to ask for her name. Uh, who does she play in Juno? She plays Juno. In okay. Juno. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure you're Even not thinking, thinking of Jennifer Garner person. or Allison Janney, but no, it is Ellen Page. 
Ellen Page. Okay, I know this one because <laughs> I'm gonna guess the other one. The other movies are Inception. Mm-hmm. Um, she wasn't. Was she in X Men Day? Like the Last Stand. The Last Stand. Didn't she play uh, Jub- Kitty. Like, Kitty. 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 Mm-hmm. Not Jubilee. <laughs> um. Okay, and. So wait, we have Juno. You said Inception, mm-hmm. the Last Stand, and like for some reason, the only thing I can think of is like the Umbrella Club, which is not. No, nope, I mean they came to include TV series, so yeah, I'll guess it. The Umbrella Academy. <laughs> Umbrella Academy. So you got one. You got Inception. Number three, they have Hard Candy, which is a really good movie. We'll have to watch <laughs> it sometime if we do a mm-hmm. Patrick Wilson marathon, maybe. Or an Ellen Page. And uh, number four is X-Men Days of Future Past. You almost said it. <laughs> <laughs> you almost said it. And then you oh, switched it to the last stand. she was in the latest one. For some reason, I thought she might have been younger in the other one. but No, she was in the last stand. But then she's also in Days of Future Past. Because that was the one that blended the oh, the two timelines. Okay. So well, I wasn't crazy. No, you're not crazy. You're just wrong. So, but I mean, you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen points. So good on you. Woo. All right. Well, now that we've had a fun game, let's talk about Greta Gerwig. Yes, Greta Gerwig. And I think the main reason I wanted to do a Greta Gerwig marathon is we we just did our Ethan Hawke marathon. And I thought of another Ethan Hawke movie that I wanted to include on there, but you know we had all three before movies clogging up the place, so I was like, let's 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 focus on Greta Gerwig then, because and Greta Gerwig is an interesting character because I feel like she, uh, actress she she brings a lot of herself into her roles, you know, like I feel like in. Most of these movies, there's a fair amount of herself in the character that she's playing. Or who, whoever, yeah, whoever <clears throat> you could say, I don't know, maybe she has kind of like this, and you know, a it good, might not be like her personal self, but there's, I don't know. Elements of her, the thing. and you know, a lot of these, you know, she even co-wrote, you know, mm-hmm. there's one... Well, two of them, at least, that she certainly co-wrote, um, including the character. And it's also interesting to view these as different. Some of these is like prequels or sequels to other movies or continuations on a character. It's interesting. So let's get into it. Um, we also started it because I knew Francis Ha was leaving Netflix, and I wanted a chance to watch that before uh, the new month started. So we started it out with Francis Ha, which is, I guess, a... a which this real I really connected, you know, with it in uh, college. You know, it's kind of like the romance between two straight women. You know, <laughs> um, a bromance or the female equivalent. A homance, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> that seems sexist. Anyways, it's it's a, about this uh, girl Frances, who's basically a dancer in, living in New York City, barely keeping up with rent and trying to find a place to live. And stuff like that, but also... After she loses her best friend slash roommate setup. Yeah, she she loses her best friend roommate setup. And it's about basically her relationship with her roommate. You know, it's like a best friend scenario, and then the relationship changes, you know. Which is one of the most heartbreaking parts of adulthood. Mm-hmm. It's and it's not that, you know, there's a major falling out or anything like that, but it's, you know, people change, they grow up, they move in different directions. Move in different directions and and occasionally it's They settle down with Patrick. <laughs> was his was name Patrick? Patrick? I don't remember. I wanna say it was like Patrick. See when you say Patrick, I always think of um Schitt's Creek. So <laughs> <laughs> no. But no, it, it's and it's uh, you know she's she's like an out of work dancer. The, the I guess the one scene that really um, stood out for me is she gets her tax refund back and immediately takes someone out to a fancy dinner. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very Stephen move. <laughs> That's very mean. It's like oh I've got an extra two hundred dollars. Let's blow it. Yeah. <laughs> Free money. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, it's so too relatable at this point. But yeah. The and... part I thought was really sweet. Mm -hmm. I love the end of the film when the various people that have supported her through everything, who you think she's maybe had many fallings out with, like, but they all come together to support her. And you're like, oh, they are still friends. <laughs> she yeah. didn't burn all those bridges. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't burn the bridges. Um... Sometimes the movie felt like it was like, bridge burning phase of life and you know, know. I, I honestly some of them weren't that you know bridge burning it was just you know awkward you know <laughs> some parts are awkward maybe and... that's just my personality i'm like oh that was awkward this bridge is burned <laughs> 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 see you never <laughs> sorry that was a little bit personal there <laughs> no nope yeah like that i i like a movie that speaks to the truth in you and that's what it spoke to is you know those bridges burnt and you know i'm, I'm glad Maybe you know not. folks will, will show up in there and you know like francis hop you know has a you know just a spirit to it that i really like mm -hmm. so it, it's a fun one so i really liked all these movies mm -hmm. they all had something kind of like sweet but relatable I think of all the movies exactly. we, we watched, there were only two of them that were new to me. Aside from that, I'd seen almost all of them, and I just wanted you to experience them. So, <laughs> um, The next one was actually one of those new-to-me ones, and it was Wiener Dog, um, directed by Todd Solins. And I, I've heard interesting things about Todd Solins, like, so I, I don't know, I guess I was worried about trying it, but I thought Wiener Dog was really sweet. It's more of a an ensemble piece, um, and it's got an adorable little wiener dog. Doo, dee, doo. It's got a great uh, theme song through one of the storylines. Yeah. Basically, it's about four different owners of the titular wiener dog um, who, who goes through um, these various owners. The first one is this uh, kid whose parents get into him after he beat cancer, and he's just the sweetest little, you know, child about dogs and stuff like that. And his parents are both very skeptical. They're like Tracy Letts and Julie Delpy from the Before series, so... Ah, oh, yeah. And then next, he, he gets picked up by um, Greta Gerwig playing Gretchen Wiener, who I guess is a character from another Todd Solondz movie called Welcome to the Dollhouse. But in that movie, she was played by Heather Matarazzo, which you'd know as the Princess uh, Diaries best friend character. Okay. Um, but I, I also hear, understand that Todd Solon's basically, I don't know, maybe he likes to burn bridges, but he'll like, he, he did a, a, a sequel to one of his movies and he recast every single actor. <laughs> and so... <laughs> well, and this one was the least Greta Gerwig performance, as yeah. much as it was also a Greta Gerwig performance. So maybe it brings something interesting to each of the... Yeah, and, and then you also have ones with Danny DeVito and, um... Ellen Burstyn later, and uh, Zoysia Mamet, what did you call her, from Girls? So, uh, wait, okay. Wow. Uh, Sorry, I put you on the spot. Shoshana, Shosh. Shosh. I leaned too hard into one of the other letters there. Shosh. <laughs> um, yeah, and it, it was a lot sweeter than you kind of expected. There's a, there's a fun, jaunty intermission in it where they have a ballad of the Wiener Dog song and stuff like that. <laughs> And it's on Amazon Prime, and it is, it's a really sweet movie, I guess. It was the kind of movie I needed that night, and I wasn't expecting it to be, and that's why it worked on me. So, <laughs> Wiener Dog is on Amazon Prime, if you got it. Um, next, we watched Maggie's Plan, which was the real reason I, I put this uh, thing together, because I, I thought about it with Ethan Hawke, but it is truly a Greta Gerwig um, stealing performance. This one was probably the top of my, like, ranking system on all these movies. Like, I really liked Maggie's Plan. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, would you describe the movie? Um, so, it is, um, it's about a woman who's uh, kind of, quote-unquote, given up on love. No, she wants to have a child, and she doesn't want to wait um, until she, she meets the right person to... You know, she feels she was raised by a single mom, and she wants to be a sing she wants to be a mom. Mm -hmm. um, and then she meets Ethan Hawke, and uh, he's in a dysfunctional marriage, and it's just 
almost looking for his way out. <laughs> <laughs> and he meets Maggie and she is like such a put together person. He's like, I found them. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it is, it's, you know, and it, it spirals from there, you know, like um, it goes one way and then like it picks up later and then it goes another way. Um, and it's interesting, like, it doesn't really condemn the characters. Like, no, yeah, that's what I liked about it, too, is, like, nobody is necessarily a bad guy. Like, you could totally relate to somebody who wants to You can to relate to terrible. Ethan Hawke. You can relate to his wife, uh, played by Julianne Moore here. Very um, excellently. <laughs> you can relate to their uh, their couple friends, played by Maya Rudolph and Bill, Bill Hader. Hader. They're so great. They're they kind of represent the the resigned married couple, or just like some days I hate this person, but <laughs> I think there was one scene where they're just like flipping each other off or something like that. And stuff like that. But they also like love each other in the sweetest way, mm -hmm. for sure. So. Yeah, we may be doing a Maya Rudolph marathon at some point soon. So <clears throat> we yes, like to please. alternate uh, ladies and dudes. So <laughs> we'll we'll take it from there. Um. But yeah, Maggie's plan, uh, that was the one I really wanted you to see, and I'm glad you liked it. This was, Fun fact, this is directed by Rebecca Miller, who is the daughter of playwright Arthur Miller, oh. who did um, like The Crucible, and she is also married to Daniel Day-Lewis. Wow. Mm -hmm. And she wrote and directed <laughs> this movie. So. Well, this movie is so charming. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I would, uh, yeah. Anyways, um, next up we did Mistress America, which is the the fall. Basically, it's the follow up to um, Francis Ha. It's also directed by Noah Baumbach, also co written by um, Greta Gerwig, and it's about this uh, college student played by Lola Kirk um, from Mozart in the Jungle and Gone Girl and other stuff she's been in. And it's about this basically freshman college student who is in New York and is basically miserable. Um, and finds out that her mom is getting married to someone and she's going to have a new stepsister who is this 30-something Greta Gerwig. And Greta Gerwig is playing the Greta Gerwig type. You know, it's it's similar to Frances Ha. She's Mistress America, you know. she's, and she's a, fabulous. She's fabulous. She's the free spirit trying to put everything together and live her best life, but also is kind of uh, just, you know, flip... I don't know how to describe manic it. Manic pixie she, dream mess. I get yeah, manic pixie dream mess. I like that. <laughs> she's she's someone who doesn't really function as an adult, but is making it work anyways. And but what's more relatable than that? What's more relatable than that? <laughs> Would that we were all so charming. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, and this one we we included because I found it in the dollar bin at Dollar Tree, and it was a great find because it's a charming movie, and I liked it. So <laughs> I liked it. You like it too. All right. Uh, next up, uh, streaming on Netflix or on Canopy, if you got it, is 20th Century Woman, uh, directed by Mike Mills. And this was one that I saw, I think it was after we were married, but I had like gone to the theater on my day off and saw it without you guys. And I, I this was another one I really wanted you to see. Yeah. And it's basically about this um, middle-aged woman raising her, her teenage son. Uh, in she, the 70s. In the 70s. So late 70s. She's, she's like uh, World War II... Stock. Stock. And it makes for interesting intergenerational, intersectional... Yeah. And she recruits some of the tenants and uh, uh, friends of her son to help raise him. And so we've got like L Fanning as the... To expand his horizons and influences. Yes. Uh, to, like it takes a village and stuff like that. And it's kind of it's it's a messy movie. It has interesting themes, but I, it is really beautiful. You know how they try to make it work. You got Billy Crudup and uh, the Greta King's Gerwig very is Timothee Chalamet. I just have to say that he was very Timothee Chalamet. He's I don't, not. But I don't, he's no, very... he's not Timothee Chalamet. <laughs> I don't remember seeing him in anything else. But I think he he does a good job with the stuff there. But like I like Billy Crudup and Greta Gerwig are both great and. Errols. Elle Fanning is the, like the girl who's slightly older than him, but it has a very platonic relationship with him, but makes him jealous because he's she's in love the, with her. She's also the girl next door. She's the girl next door who is promiscuous and stuff like that. And 
And then Annette Benning is really good as the mother in this yeah, as well. Yeah, I really liked her. She and, did a great job. Yeah, it really, you know, captures on some of the things. And then another thing I like about it is it talks about all the, a lot of good that Planned Parenthood does, you know. And it's just a charming movie, so. Yeah, definitely. Like, it's just kind of a movie about making your way in the world. Yep, and learning how to be a person. What it's like to be a man in feminism. So, <laughs> or a woman, or a woman. Uh, next up was the winner of our um, our listener or our Twitter poll. Uh, Isle of Dogs. It's just a solid little flick. It's a I solid little flick. You know, it's an ensemble piece. Uh, it's very Wes Andersony. Um, Greta Gerwig has a supporting role as the. Uh, American exchange steward student fighting. I have to say, watching all of these other movies um, really brought something new to the Greta Gerwig character in this movie. <laughs> I always liked the character, but it just brought something absolutely new. And I feel like she did such a good job as a voice actress. Yeah, she she stuck up for what you she believed in. She she had a simmering rage, you know. Yeah, I, I feel like she stepped away from like the tr like. I feel like you can see that she changed her form. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you can appreciate that more. Yeah, it, it certainly does, so. <laughs> um, she's angry. To adapt to the media. That's all I'm saying. It's just a couple. And it, it, it is a charming little movie that kind of really does sum up what it's like living in America now, even though it is set in uh, Japan. You know, and some, sometimes it's easier to, to paint analogies when they're using something else as the backdrop, you know. Yeah, well, it's like uh, it's like Parasite, right? Mm -hmm. We all live in capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> we all live in the same country, and that country is capitalism. Yes. Uh, this one is more uh, fascism against uh, fascism the downtrodden. Against the and against the backdrop of a pandemic, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that too. Um, the next one, uh, this is one I never even heard of, but you saw it, and we saw it was streaming for free on Tubi, which is an ad-supported uh, streaming service, but The Dish and the Spoon. Yeah. And this was an, an interesting one. Like, it, it's from 2010, so this is early Greta Gerwig. She, she plays a woman whose husband cheated on her, I guess, and so she goes on a bender <laughs> and runs into basically a homeless British boy. Um Live. Homeless foreign exchange student. Kind well, of kid. like he's, he's a he, he's, he's 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 some kid who came to visit a girl and got spurned there, and then just starts hanging out with his lady, and they start you know causing trouble and getting up to shenanigans, and it's very loose type of movie. There's not much of a standard plot to it, mm -hmm. and and both of them are charming. Greta Gerwig is charming and, and making uh, terrible decisions. And yeah, and Ollie Alexander, I guess, is the other one. He's he's very good as well. Something we we haven't talked about is a lot of these characters dance, which is I feel like something that Greta Gerwig brings into her performances is a sense of dance. Like Frances Ha, she's specifically a, a dancer in that there. But like also in Maggie's Plan and Twentieth Century Woman, and I think even Mistress America and Dish in the Spoon, you also see her like dancing in scenes to like express frustration. Her characters will like dance mm -hmm. and express it with movement, which is something I really appreciate about that. Yeah, for sure. And that is all seven movies of our Greta Gerwig marathon. But we also had to watch Damsels in Distress because that was my favorite. That's my and first ever Greta Gerwig movie. That was, I loved it. That was your first yeah, Greta Gerwig first movie Greta that you'd ever seen? Mm-hmm. Oh, and that's nice. But anyways, I, I shared you it with Jessica, with and I was, hoping, I was hoping it would get um, the listener poll, and Jessica told me I want it. she wanted it to win the listener poll, and it didn't. It came close, though, So, but we decided we would watch it anyways. And Damsels in Distress is directed by uh, Whit Stillman, who did um, a movie called Metropolitan in the early 90s, and which is really good and covers some of the same themes. But this one is uh, basically about teenager... Um, college students at a university um, figuring out their way. Mm. And they, it's just a charming, sweet movie with dancing, and it's just lovely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on uh, Dam's Love? Dam's Love? Do you have any thoughts on this movie, Jess? Um, it's definitely, like, 
a, like a movie about what it's like to be a young person and like finding yourself uh, as a young person. Yeah, you want to do good things, which may be um, starting dance classes for the clinically depressed so they don't kill themselves. Hey, damn. Type of thing. Or, you know, and even those people who seem the most put together aren't as put together as they'd like you to believe. So, anyways, <laughs> that is our Greta Gerwigathon. Now for our entry of suspense in Rear Window by Alfred Hitchcock. Was he British? He was. Alfred Hitchcock was very bad. I don't know what kind of voice I'm doing. <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock was British. Doing a left turn into Scotland. And he directed Rear Window, which isn't... Rear Window isn't a particularly scary movie. But it is interesting to watch it nowadays. Do you think I have a fever? You're very clammy. I, I feel... Anyway. I don't know. It's an interesting time. Just, uh, maybe I have the... The COVID. Dog flu or oh, whatever it was. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it does. It does have an interesting connotation watching it um, within quarantine. Uh, could you? move? Really my know. foot is oh, stuck. Because <laughs> it's like life becomes what you're watching through. Yeah, it is interesting. Would Rear Window have is would Rear Window exist in our current society because we have hours and hours of content that we could binge on? Thanks, Netflix. Thank if 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 Netflix had existed in 1954, Raymond Burr would have gotten away with it. Well, it's not like anybody's life gets saved. No, <laughs> they catch a murderer, but they don't save the girl. Yeah, she's well, she is dead already. She's already collateral damage. So mm -hmm. you know, and maybe it just keeps us from the horrible things that dwell beneath the surface of our society. <laughs> I, I guess that's a, a deeper theme you can have there. It's, it is interesting watching some of these older movies. Um, and not necessarily the... Um, I guess he could murder again. He could murder again. I, I, I guess that's another thing with the... Well we'll, well, we'll talk about the murderer in a second. It's, it's easy to, to think about the differences of society in these uh, mo movies. Because, you know, you got... Um, Jimmy Stewart, and he's holed up in a because he shattered his leg in several places and stuff like that. It's the last an exciting photograph. Getting an exciting photograph, and he's bored out of his mind, so he's just watching his neighbors. And he's got this um, lovely, elegant uh, Grace Kelly uh, coming by, who loves him unconditionally, but he isn't sure he wants to marry her because she's so prim and proper and perfect. And he's not the Marian kind, you know? Uh, it got me, gave me vibes from, um, what's it called? The Philadelphia mo story? No, not the Philadelphia story, but that is definitely a possibility. Um, arsenic and old lace. Okay, I was gonna say, I feel like, I feel like that's like the archetypal male in like a lot of those old, um, it's like, I'm not the Marian kind! Yeah, it makes, makes me kind of wonder what what I kind of things they are. Are, are, are they not Marian because they're just like F boys, you know? <laughs> 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 I'm not going to have some lady tie me down. I got to play the field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Jimmy Stewart is an F boy. That would, That's what you can take from they here. They love the life of a bachelor. <laughs> <laughs> they love the life of a bachelor. Or maybe they love the life of a bachelor, as you know. Maybe bachelor is an old-timey way to save. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. Anyways, so Grace Kelly comes and prepares him dinner and talks about her high society life, in which she's very she's busy, but she still vision. cooks. She is Gorgeous. She, she, is, she Grace is. Kelly retired from acting at the age of 26. How old was she in this movie? Well, I imagine uh, she was probably like 24, maybe 23. And, you know, I was reading she was often paired with these dudes who she's 20 or 30 years younger than. I was going to say, like, okay, Jimmy Stewart is looking even grayer than I thought. Nope, yeah. Any, anyways, she, she's just one of those people that has so much class that she's ageless. No, yeah, she she's classy. She brings it in there. She she'd worked with Hitchcock. I think this was the middle of her Hitchcocks. You know, right after this, she would be in to catch a thief and stuff like that. She'd won her Oscar pretty early, 
And she will always be more of an adult than I am, even though she was 24 in this movie. <laughs> that's what yeah. I mean. She is like class age. <laughs> and, and and that's what it is. She's immortalized in that age forever. Because that, Let's see, she's maybe that was smart of her to, to get out of Dodge before she aged out. I mean, sadly, she died in 1982 or 72. She, she died at the age of 52. Of what? Oh, she was 52? She was in her 50s when, or okay. late 40s. When she died, she died in a car accident. So. I was wondering, for some reason, the way you'd put it, I was thinking maybe she must have died closer to when she retired. No, she she actually retired and um, she died in 1982 at age 52. So. So. She was, she was still pretty young, but, you know, she devoted herself to being a full-time princess and mother. And, you know, that is just as fulfilling her pursuit as being a glamorous movie star she can do it all <laughs> and and she's classless anyways uh, let, let's classless. talk more about uh classless maybe i was not saying that quite right no 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 you're right she's a classless <laughs> lady she's a classy lady i don't know what i'm saying i think i was trying to say timeless and classy together. no i think you that that makes sense she's so timeless and classy she's classless <laughs> But anyways, um, <laughs> Rear Window, obviously, you got Jimmy Stewart giving nicknames to all his neighbors who do all their business with the windows open, except for the young, recently married couple. So <laughs> <laughs> they shut it, and then the boy is all henpecked because the lady just isn't satisfied. And then you got Miss Torso, who's some ballerina constantly, you know, doing an exhibition for her neighbors. You got Miss Lonely Hearts. You got Miss Lonely Hearts, who just wants love, but then has a bad time. Then you got the songwriter, who's trying to write a song, but just can't get it right. And he's played by Ross Bogazarian, who you would probably know better as Dave Seville and his chipmunks. Wonder, what is the timeline? Was he trying to come up with the chipmunks routine, perhaps? No, no. I think this <laughs> was... <just> teasing. <laughs> His character ultimately creates... Yeah, all this... Dave a... and the chipmunks. Miss Lonely Hearts is about to kill herself, but then she hears... Christmas, Christmas time is here! <laughs> <laughs> and is inspired to keep living. <laughs> okay, maybe that's not what she hears. That inspires her to keep living. She she hears the thing that's almost as good as that and inspires her to kill. Yeah. Clearly that's his next hit. And then of course you've got Raymond Burr and his nagging wife who suddenly disappears one day and peeping Tom Jimmy Stewart suspects that he has killed her wife. And good thing he has a Thelma Ritter on hand to make it explicit. And it's like, oh, she probably chopped him up into tiny pieces. <laughs> Because, so good in this. yeah, well, Thelma, Fit, Thelma Ritter is a classic, and we'll see more of her in a few other movies. She's she's a stock character actress. She always plays the Thelma Ritter type. Character so, actress, actress, Martin. Character actress, Thelma Ritter. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, um, what was I saying about Thelma Ritter? Yeah, and I think it fits into, um... Hitchcock's kind of sense of humor as well to give her those lines because one it's disarming to have this middle-aged woman talking about murder and stuff like that and it allows it to to paint the picture kind of to get around any decency censors about talking about terrible stuff it's like oh but it's this adorably funny lady uh talking about chopping them up into pieces so bearing one to the rose garden yeah and all of this is you know it's all seen from uh Jimmy Stewart's point of view, basically, and we're just trying to, you, you don't know if he's crazy or not, and occasionally it'll show you something that he doesn't see. And so you think, oh, he's been deceived, mm -hmm. because he or didn't see this or that, and we He's did. making it up, but then, you know, things spiral out of hand, like when the poor little doggy gets killed. Which is so sad. All he ever did was like you. Did you kill him because he liked you? <laughs> The only person here that was nice to everyone. Oh, that was so sad. That was so sad. That was the the poor little puppy. And then there, I, I like the one neighbor. She kind of reminded me of the the lady in the Florida project. She was like suntanning, 
the, just an older lady there. She's like kind of a busybody. She's hanging out in her bikini and stuff like that. And she's giving people talking points and just annoying them. But I was like, oh, good on this lady. I like her. She's living her best life. She's That's living her best she's life. She's not letting anyone get in her way. Now, was are there any moments? I mean, we've seen this movie several times. We've actually seen it maybe a year or two ago. So it was still pretty fresh. Is there any moments that you think, you know, from the first time you saw it, you thought were kind of thrilling or scary? I guess the final scene, I, I do appreciate how that's put together, where the they they lose track of the, you know, the killer, and he comes and confronts Jimmy Stewart in his own house. Yeah, that part is messed up. Kind of terrifying. <laughs> and, you know, another thing about this movie is you kind of also feel for the murderer guy. Because, like, you know, he, he, he doesn't, like, he didn't do it for, for money. And, like, he doesn't seem to have a lot of money. And, you know, he thinks he's almost gotten away with it. But, you know, it's still kind of pathetic, you know, the way you do it. So you kind of, I'm not going to say you feel bad for him because he killed the wife and stuff like that. But you kind of feel and bad for him. And the dog. And the dog. You're right. Lost me. You're right. Me. Screw this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to railroad you. No, but, like, the, the, the way that he is portrayed, he's at least. He's a very everyman. He is a, a very everyman murderer. So, type of thing. You I know? guess it's like saying anybody's capable of murder. Maybe. Maybe it's supposed to be unsettling in that sense. But yeah, I, I do like the way that Raymond Burr portrays him, you know, when we, we finally get to know him. You know, he doesn't seem malicious, but he's like, what do you want me to do? I <laughs> kind of deal. So, anyways. Doesn't he seem malicious? He hacksawed his wife. He did hacksaw his wife. You're right. <laughs> he is he killed mild. a dog. He is very mild-mannered every time you see him. He's not, like, over the top. No one would ever think he would hack up his wife, but he was just so quiet. Mm -hmm. Now we have the internet where our bassist, uh... Baser cells come... come can be on full display all the time, so... All right. Well, that is um, Rear Window. Um, we watched this on Peacock, which was we have streaming on our cable for free. Although this version was ad supported, so that was a little whatever. But uh, it's there for free if you want to catch up with it. Yeah. Uh, any other final thoughts on Hitchcock or the anything else? No, I mean it's it's interesting. I wonder at what point in her career. Uh, um, Grace Kelly came across Hitchcock. He's famously not very good with his actresses, right? <laughs> <laughs> She's like, fetch this. <laughs> I mean, he, he worked with her a few times, and he, I guess he tried to lull her out of retirement, but she did not bite, so. Because she's a smart lady. She, she, she bagged her princess hood, so. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, I have a safe Halloween. We may have another episode before then. I doubt it, but we might. But we'll probably consider it more of a Thanksgiving-ish episode. Happy, um, Happy Canadian, Canadian Thanksgiving, Canadian Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving um, which will have passed by the time you're hearing this because we're recording this on Canadian Thanksgiving. Um, but yeah, um, um, that's it for this show. Um, we've actually recently started a Twitter feed for this show it's at dreams made of on twitter um and so you can follow us there we'll post our um you know episodes there as well as do polls for what actors we should do marathons for and what movies we should include in those said marathons um next next time we're going to be doing a john c Riley marathon so check out our twitter feed for the movies that are going to be included in that and our AFI movie is going to be, checks notes, A Streetcar Named Desire. Ah. So Stella! <laughs> <laughs> As always, I'm Stephen Spooky Sparky Parker. And I'm uh, Jessica Parker. And Stella!